This is the Trout Bitten Podcast. Trout Bitten. Trout Bitten? Trout Bitten. Trout Bitten. Trout Bitten? Yeah. Trout Bitten. Trout Bitten. It's about trout. Wild trout. This is Trout Bitten. So this is the Trout Bitten Podcast. Welcome back and thanks for tuning in. I'm Dominic Swantoski the owner of Troutbitten and the author of Troutbitten.com. I started all of this in 2014, and now the website hosts over 750 of my articles with tips and tactics, stories and more about fly fishing for wild trout in wild places. And this podcast series is the latest branch of the Troutbitten project. If you visit Troutbitten.com, you'll find a category for streamers in the menu. And much of what we'll talk about tonight is detailed in those articles. There are at least 100 of them really, that break down the way we take a streamer to the trout. A book's worth of information about fishing with the long flies. So here's the thing. When we're fishing a streamer, we're trying to make it look alive. But while fly fishing in other ways, we spend so much of our time dead drifting, dry flies and nymphs and trying to impart no motion. So switching to streamers is, it's a relief. It's liberating. It's fun. And so many presentations, so many looks to the streamers uh, can be attractive and convincing because everything works sometimes. But day to day, some retrieves and some presentations just work better. And there's no question about it. Sometimes hammering the banks with a fast jerk strip brings the big trout out to play. And other days, it's a soft crossover technique that really turns on those same trout. The joy of streamer fishing is that so many things can work. And trying them all is a great way to spend our time on the water. On a dry fly, I'll tell you what they want. It's a dead drift. On a nymph, same thing. And the closer you can get to that pure, unaltered drift, the more convincing your fly presentation will be. Let's say 95% of the time, it's a dead drift on a nymph or a dry fly. But on streamers, show them a slow slide or a head flip. Give them a speed lead, a touch and go, or an endless retrieve. See what works. That's the fun of streamer fishing. Make the fly look alive in the water. It's not dead drifting anymore. It's swimming a living bait fish that can do a bunch of predictable and unpredictable things. Sometimes it seems like the trout are looking for one kind of action on the fly, or at least that's what turns them on the most. Other times, many of these presentations seem to work. But the point is to make that fly swim. Give life to the streamer. Convince the trout that they're looking at a living, swimming creature. So that's what we're here to talk about tonight. We are ready to break down streamer presentations. We'll discuss ways to move the fly. We'll get into head position, depth, speed, and holding versus crossing currents and seams. We'll touch on natural looks versus attractive ones. Should we make it easy for them or make them chase? Then we'll talk about a few different specific presentations. Many of them I have names for because that's what I do. I'm a writer and all good things need a name. Likewise, my friends have their own favorite looks and presentations to make a streamer full of trout. So let's meet these guys. Here are four of my good friends and some of the best anglers that I know. Uh, Here's Austin Dando, also known as Young Love. (laughs) That's right. right. Austin, do you tie a loop knot to your streamers? Yeah. um, Good question. So loop knot, for any listeners who are not familiar, is a uh, style of knot that basically it has an open loop on the end that anglers will often use on a streamer pattern. The idea is that it lends more motion to the fly and a more uh, swim-like um, type of feature when the fly is in motion in the water. I, I fished a loop knot for, I don't know, maybe a year or so exclusively yeah. with streamers, and I came away with a couple different opinions about it. One thing is the, the leader material I often fish with is a eight-pound, pretty supple mono. Yeah. and that mono being as supple as it is lends a fair amount of motion to the fly already from the rod tip. So in my experiments, specifically, let's say on a, a, a streamer that does not have an articulation to it. Okay. I did not find any advantage to a loop knot in those flies. Mm-hmm. If I was fishing a, a 10 or 15 pound, like maximum leader, mm-hmm. where it's much more stiff, then I found myself leaning more towards the loop knot. Um, where I thought that movement maybe suffered some from the stiffness of the leader material, mm-hmm. and the uh, loop knot would lend itself back to giving that motion. 
One thing I did notice, perhaps though, on on articulated flies, one of the one of the ways an articulated fly moves is by the the jerking and the twitching of the rod tip, and a lot of that goes straight down into the fly. And when I put a loop knot mm. in a fly uh, that was articulated, a lot of that motion got absorbed by the loop knot itself. Oh, oh, I like that. That's a good point. So so the back half of the fly wouldn't move nearly as much as it mm. would, uh, not nearly as dramatically as it would if it would be stopped short and fast on a, on a solid knot. So overall, I prefer um, for my style of fishing, just doing a either an improved clinch or a regular clinch or a, um, a davy. Sometimes I'll, I'll triple the davy if it's a really thin or a thick uh, hook eye on the, on the hook there. Mm. Almost everything you said is how I feel about it. Anybody else? So, so do you think it matters if the fly is weighted or unweighted? Uh, slightly, yes. Yeah, I think the weight of the fly could overcome a stiffer mono and impart more motion uh, potentially. Yeah. I, I know like a lot of times when I fish bass flies, bass flies are unweighted. Mm-hmm. And so when when that fly is unweighted, it, when it has that loop knot and has a little bit more movement, that will matter just the a hair more, I think, in that case. Nice. Yeah, I could see that. Yep. I, I do know there. there's a big push out there a lot of times. Oh, you, hey, you're fishing streamers, you have to have a loop knot. To me, it's like strip setting. Everybody wants to tell you, hey, it's got to be, yeah, I always have to strip set. I don't always strip set, and I don't always use a loop knot. I think that's what you guys are saying, too. Hey, yep. uh, here's Dr. Trevor Smith. Hi, Trevor. Good evening. Good evening. So as one of my night fishing buddies, you, I figured I'd ask you this. How is a streamer for night fishing designed differently than streamers that you fish in the daylight? Yeah, good question. Mm. I think that night streamers, for me, um, are designed to serve a few purposes that are unique to night conditions. Yeah. The first being that because it is nighttime and visibility is decreased, I value the ability for the fish to locate the fly. Sure. And that means, one, that I'm generally tying larger streamers than I fish in the daytime. Um, maybe three to four inches versus the two to three inch range. And then two, I like to tie in some aspect of material that creates turbulence in the water and maybe makes it easier for the fish to locate the fly with their lateral line. So mm. deer hair heads are prominent on my night flies um, from a streamer standpoint. Mm-hmm. And if not just that, you know, using rubber legs or using some sort of build up head that kind of pushes water, some aspect of it I want to really help the fish locate uh, that fly. Color-wise, I think I fish almost exclusively black or dark flies at night, um, mainly because I'm looking for that darker silhouette uh, cast above the fish. And so while I do use some subtleties within my patterns, the majority of the colors are dark. And then weight is probably the final one. I tie very light weight flies uh, for night fishing. Because I want to control the depth of that fly and I want it to, as a default, kind of ride on top um, or ride the surface or ride just under the surface. So I don't want to put any weight, I don't want to put any unnecessary weight into that fly. If I want to sink it, I'll do it with split shot, but I want to be able to ride it high if I want to. Right on. Um, And then materials, I guess I, I failed to mention that too, even just outside of the turbulence factor. I want materials that don't hold water, mainly for that eight. Uh, purpose. So uh, whether that be the deer hair, whether that be fox fur, whether that be some of the artificial minnow brushes, I want the materials that I'm using to not waterlog and pull that fly down as much as possible. So we talked a lot uh, a lot about that, those kind of design mm-hmm. features in the uh, uh, Mouse Emerger night fishing podcast that you and I and, and Josh did. Uh, so yeah. you guys have that pen dragon. You ever fished that during yep. the day? I did recently. Yep. Yeah. Did for you? the first time. And I did not I did yeah. not catch anything on it. Yeah. So maybe yeah. noteworthy, maybe not. It that that <laughs> happens with streamers sometimes. And so Oh, that's for sure. Yeah. yeah, I'd like to I'd like to fish it in the day. I know you fish the the rogue in the daytime. I do. And um, yeah, as time yeah. goes on, I fish it. Yeah, one of my favorite streamer patterns at night is called a rogue. It's designed to be just under the surface. And yeah, the as the years go by, I fish it more and more, mm-hmm. sometimes very close to the surface. And I use it for what I call a death drift, mm. not a dead drift, but a death drift. We might cover that later. But I often will use just throw a split shot on it, and, and I, I'll fish that rogue a lot during the day now, um, usually in yeah. an olive color and usually black or white at night. Yeah. My reason for switching over to it 
to to try it out during the day was really I just wanted to see some of the retrieves that mm. we were doing at night. I wanted to see them yes, in the daylight yeah. just to see what that actually looked like because I had not seen that before. Right. That's yeah. valuable. Yeah. Right. For sure. Yeah. Hey, here's my friend Bill Dell. Hey, Bill. Uh, we explain the way you set up your rod rack in your SUV. Uh, I know you have. <laughs> wait a second. I know that you have a rod vault now. All right. But you used to have in your uh, SUV a uh, sort of a, a rod rack in the back. That's what I have now. I have a Smith Crick uh, rod holster or rod holder, and it's cool. Uh, but you made something yourself that fit real nicely in your SUV. Will you tell us about that? Because I actually get a lot of questions on that. Anytime we put a picture of that on Trout Pit, and I get questions about it. So I went through I went through two different iterations of it. The first iteration was just straight bungee cords. And so the problem with the bungee cords is when you get more than two rods in those bungee cords and you're driving down a back road and starts bumping, <laughs> those rods start smacking and bouncing yeah. around everywhere. It doesn't matter yeah. how tight you pull them. Yep. And so my kind of solution to that was to get basically a piece of wood that was as wide as what your car was. And so on the on the back of most SUVs, in the backs, in both of the back seats, there's usually kind of like a handle back there. Yeah. And that handle is uh, used to hang like your suits or pieces of clothing for the most <laughs> part, you know. Fisher, fishermen are all about carrying their Depending suits Depending on what type of man you are. Yes. Yes. And so what I did was I measured a piece of wood that was about a half inch thick by, I forget what the measurement was. Let's say it was uh, 40 inches wide. And so I measured it to fit exactly between those two bars. And then I cut it to fit. And so when you try to put it in between there, if you cut it right, it's not going to fit. Uh, if you pop off those handles, there's usually two nuts on either side of them. Yeah. And so you can unscrew that, put the piece of wood up, and then put the screws back in. And that piece of wood will kind of stay stabilized between those two bars. Yeah. Then what I did was I got some Velcro. And so if you go to Lowe's or Home Depot, any type of hardware store, they sell Velcro in, I don't know, three foot strips yeah, and you can basically cut it to length. And so what I did was I just took that, cut it to, let's say six inches and kind of wrapped it over itself, screwed it into the board, but the, the screw is obviously going to be smaller than what your board thickness is. And so, you know, run three or four of those across there, space them out, and then kind of a similar piece of wood. Uh, I put in the back part of my SUV. This is where it gets tricky because the newer car I have doesn't have those, and so that's why I went away from it. Yeah. But most SUVs in the back will have a, an additional hook. Yeah. And so you can run that, run a board across there if you want to, you know, if you were like me and you didn't care, I screwed that board into because there was a hard plastic on that hook. Yeah. And so I ran screws into that, or you can put like hooks on the end of those boards and hook them on the the hooks that come down. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And so, yeah, you can put Velcro, same thing, cut Velcro to length, and then you can just kind of thread the rod through, put it as secure as you want. But because the, it was wood instead of the bungee cords, when you went down back rows, it didn't bounce around and your rods didn't go all <laughs> over the place. I gotcha. Yeah, I've seen similar things uh, online. Uh, but yours was a little different, and maybe we'll go through that someday on a on a YouTube video on the Trout Pitting channel. Thanks, Bill. Okay, here's Josh Darling. Hey, Josh, will you tell us a little bit about Wilds Media and what you do? Because that's another thing I get a lot of questions about. What is Wilds Media? Yeah, man. Thank you. Uh, Wilds Media is primarily a video and photo studio that's focused on capturing the character and story of outdoor brands and the outdoor lifestyle. Nice. Um, I also try to help use it to, especially through Instagram and stuff, to teach people who are a little bit more DIY by nature how to do some of the things yeah. that I'm doing from editing to using a, a camera out there on the river. Um, really, it started with, I always kind of had a knack for techie design things. For sure. And so I took some classes, you know, on that stuff in, in college and I decided, you know, I'm fishing all the time. I'm on the river all the time. I'm taking pictures all the time. Let's try and yeah. try and make this into a company. And so it's it's been going really well. Yeah. Hey, it's been fun to watch it grow, buddy. I love it. Okay, thanks, Josh. Hey, let's take a short break and come right back with a deep conversation about streamer presentations. 
Whether you're on the water or at the fly tying bench, Avid Max has you covered. AvidMax.com offers an impressive scope of premium brands and products to help you achieve your ultimate goal, success on the water. The catalog of over 19,000 products includes everything a fly angler or a fly tire desires. With fast shipping and expert knowledge, you get the gear you need when you need it. Listeners of the Trout Pitten Podcast receive a discount when shopping at AvidMax.com with the coupon code TROUTPITTEN10. No spaces. Enter the code at checkout to get 10% off your first order. From high mountain streams to the salt flats, Avid Max has the gear and expertise to elevate your game. Fulling Mill is the world's leading producer of flies, fly boxes, hooks, beads, and tippet. Known for their barbless hooks, they have many of your favorite trout patterns tied barbless. Not only that, they feature patterns from anglers like George Daniel, Pat Weiss, Josh Miller, Joe Goodspeed, and many others from around the world. Every pattern is backed by the 200% fulling mill guarantee. If a fly isn't up to the highest standards that you expect, they will replace it with two that are. Stock up at FullingMill.com or ask for the flies at your local dealer. All right, so let's break down streamer presentations. We can't cover everything here tonight, and we wouldn't even dare try. There are probably hundreds of ways to move and retrieve the fly after the cast. And I'm sure we'll dedicate full podcasts to some of those ways in the future. Instead, though, let's talk first about what all streamer presentations really come down to. And by understanding how we set up the rod tip and the line after the cast, by thinking about ways we move the fly and how our line hand, rod tip, and leader animate the fly and bring it to life, we build a foundation for understanding all the presentations that follow. We'll get into a handful of our favorite presentations in a bit, but let's start with this. First things first, as the fly lands, when the streamer hits the water, it's critical to have the rod tip and the line under control. The position of the rod and the line sets up everything else. Hey, Bill, you want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I guess I have two different types of, I guess, landing or finishing the cast. And so there's times I like to finish higher, meaning... I will stop the rod at maybe a, a right around my shoulder. Okay. And so that's normally when I'm fishing to my strong side. So if I'm right-handed and so if I'm fishing to a right-hand bank, I usually prefer to stop and keep the rod high and don't drop the tip of the rod. And so okay. I want the rod to kind of be elevated. And then from that position... I'm able to keep all of the slack in that cast. It's almost like a, a streamer tuck cast, so to speak, mm-hmm. where you're stopping it. Sure. You're, everything is tight immediately. Sure. And you're, at that point, you can choose to stall that streamer on the bank. You can choose to you know, strip a few times. But the most important thing is when that streamer lands, you're tight to it. Because if you're fishing a bank, yeah. a lot of times the fish are going to be on that bank. And so you want instant contact because that streamer could be in the water a a half a second and the fish could eat it. Mm -hmm. And so if you've got slack, you've got a problem. Yeah. I'm going to back up to where you said tuck cast. A lot of people were going to say tuck cast, uh, that introduces slack. Uh, It can. But I've been careful to kind of identify the tuck cast as really it's a turnover cast. We're trying to turn everything over before it hits the water. Just turn it over. And you can turn it over. And then have contact as it enters. You can also turn it over and introduce slack on purpose. And I think Mm. it sounds like what you're saying is you just want that control over the fly when it enters because they might eat it right away. Yep, exactly. I hear you. To me, like the tuck cast is almost, you're creating an abrupt stop in your casting motion. So in this case, with a streamer, that streamer has all the weight. And so it's going to, when you stop abruptly, streamer's just going to lay your leader out pretty much in a straight line. Mm -hmm. The other finishing motion is sometimes I prefer to have the rod tip down. So when you're casting, um, you're casting out, you want to finish with your rod close to the water. At that point, it's usually when I'm fishing in an angle, maybe downstream of me, which is rare. But if I'm fishing shallower water, I'll often want it to be like that versus keeping the rod higher. Mm -hmm. When you're finishing, same thing. You finish and you're immediately in contact, but your rod is in that position for you to immediately start stripping. It sounds like what you're saying most is as you finish, you're thinking about what you're going to want to do first or next, right? Yeah, correct. You're ready for your first motion on the streamer. 
something I'll do is uh, something not necessarily as dramatic as a tuck cast, yeah. but finish the rod tip high, but, but lower than where you would stop a rod for the tuck. Mm-hmm. Let that line enter in on a on a tight line, and then drop the rod tip after the fly hits the water. Sure. So it lands it lands tight, and then I drop the rod tip, and that angle change introduces just a little bit of slack mm-hmm. that uh, that if a fish were to eat it, it's enough that you notice it right away, mm-hmm. but it's not enough to hinder your flies from dropping into the column. I like what you said. The fly goes in, and then you get to decide where the line's going to go. If you're going to lay line mm-hmm. on the water, now you get to decide where that goes. That's key. Yeah. And the only time I'm laying line on the water is usually if I'm casting 30 feet away. Yeah. Most of the time, I I don't, I don't prefer to do that with a streamer. Sure. I will say this is the majority of this fishing is wade fishing. Um, Oh, good point. Some of this is going to translate. Like, I think this can be done out of a boat, but the majority of the streamer fishing that we're talking about is wade fishing. And so there's a, a huge difference with, you know, fishing from a boat, you have to take into effect. You know, the speed of the boat, the speed of the current, mm, yes. the speed of the seams. And so, yeah, I think we're, what we're talking about now is wade, wade fishing for the I'm, most part. I'm really glad you brought that up. That's a good point. Many of the presentations that we're going to talk about, many of the things we're going to talk about, absolutely translate when you're wade fishing or you're float fishing. Uh, but some of them, some of them, and I think it's going to be kind of obvious, really, uh, some of them are not possible when when you're floating. So our perspective, I think all, well, I'm sure all of us here do more wading than floating, but that's not everybody, you know, uh, but we can all learn from each other. Hey, let's talk about ways to move the fly. All right. So moving the fly is at the heart of all good streamer retrieves and presentations. I mean, that's it. We're trying to move it. Again, we can dead drift a streamer. But more often, the goal is to make it look alive, to make it swim, get it moving, and try to entice some of the best trout in the river. There are really two ways to move the fly. You can move it with a line hand, and you can move it with the rod tip. So the line hand, um, that's, that'd be the left hand, Austin, not the right hand. Mm, disagree. Right. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> so for us right-handed people, the line hand is our left hand. The line hand can, can strip in line. I think we know what that means. First, it goes through your trigger finger on your right hand. That's important. It goes through your trigger finger on your rod hand. And of course, we can hand twist with that, a figure eight retrieve or a hand twist. Do you guys use the hand twist much in your presentations? I don't. I'm a stripper. Yeah, I don't either. Right. Not yep. really. Josh, do you use it much? No, not very often. I don't either. Really, I'm trying to do more animations than the hand twist is going to give me. When I'm swinging flies, especially at night, there are things that I'll do with a hand twist that I'll, I'll mix in a hand twist and then rod tip motion, hand twist mm-hmm. and then rod tip motion. So that's the line hand, right? Strip it in line and hand twist. That's very obvious. You can do small strips, large strips, you know, short or long strips. Now the rod tip is the other thing we can do. And this gets pretty interesting. We can jig with the rod tip. We can jerk with the rod tip. We can do small twitches with the rod tip. Maybe there's another word you could throw in the mix. I think the uh, the other item is like elevation of the rod tip. The elevation of your rod tip mm. will also determine the sink rate of the fly. Yeah. So if you have a higher rod tip, you're gonna the fly's gonna go deeper. And right. So there's a lot you can do with that too. Right on. But while that rod is elevated, we can jig it, we can jerk it, or we can twitch it. So what I'm talking about is what you do with the very end of the rod, whether it's low or it's high. The things that you can do with the rod tip. You can jig it. I think we know what that means, like up and then let it drop. I don't know what you guys have experienced, but certainly learning to animate a streamer or even animate nymphs on the mono rig Mm. has taken some practice for me because I think Mm -hmm. anytime you animate with the tip of your rod, you bring in the potential for slack to develop, right? As that spring kind of of the rod tip as it recovers, right? Right. And so I think it's just an interesting thing to work on drifting with nymphs and animating you know sort of getting used to this smooth steady Mm -hmm. animation where you're almost like accelerating through the drop after the rod tip twitch or whatever you want to do just to kind of pick up that slack i guess you could also hand twist retrieve to kind of pull in that slack um but i love using the rod tip for streamer animation yeah and yet i'm always sort of in this interplay and balance between using my rod tip 
and then recovering some of the slack that follows that animation with my hand. For sure. And I sort of find myself doing it naturally, mm -hmm. but I remember when I first mm -hmm. began doing it, it wasn't very natural and I would miss a lot of strikes or kind of not mm -hmm. hook a fish well because it was hitting during that mm -hmm. pause when I was out of contact. Right on. So everything you do, whether it's a jig or a jerk or a twitch with the rod tip creates a little bit of slack. And I was going to mm -hmm. ask what you guys think the difference is in the motion to the fly with strips versus motion to the fly using the rod tip. But I think that's it. You know, mm -hmm. when you're stripping, you really maintain tension the whole time. You're not, when you strip, you're not creating any slack. Mm -hmm. But when what you're saying, Trevor, is with the rod yeah. tip, whether you jig or you jerk it or you just twitch it a little bit. Now, all of a sudden, as that rod tip recovers, it actually pushes a tiny, a t either a tiny bit. With, yeah. a, with a twitch and, yeah. or, or a good bit of, of slack into the system. Yeah, and it probably, I mean, even the, the type of rod you're using probably makes a pretty big impact on that as well. If you have a pretty soft tip that doesn't recover as quickly, you're going to introduce more slack. Yes. And, you know, a stiffer rod or a faster action is probably going to have a little less issue with that. But, um, yeah, th I think there's just a lot of subtlety to that, and it takes some time to learn to do that well. I definitely don't think that that's a weakness of that method, though. No. Yes, sir. I think that right. can be a really big benefit because oftentimes what we're trying to imitate is something totally. that's, that's dead or dying or injured. And when we, mm. let, when we let the current do what it does to that fly as, as slack, as, as we're not causing any kind of drag on that, yeah. then we're seeing, the, or the trout are seeing, what that streamer, what that bait fish or whatever we're imitating is, we're... we're, we're allowing it to succumb to death a little bit, you know? <laughs> I like that. You can see videos yeah. of this. You know, we build our streamers with marabou and hackle yeah. and all, all the things that we build them with, things that'll breathe and pulsate under the water. If you give them a chance, give them that little bit of slack, they kind of open up, mm -hmm. you know, the marabou. Let's just think of marabou. It's the easiest one because it's, it, yeah, it breathes so much. Well, if you give it just a chance to breathe, if all you're doing is stripping the whole time, imagine a continuous retrieve with marabou. It would never really have a chance to, to open up, right? But when you give it this little bit of slack that really the rod tip motions give it, the jigs or the, or the jerks or the twitches, then that little bit of slack that it has, just for a second maybe, or for a couple seconds, who knows, depending on the retrieve, then it opens up, that marabou opens up, and then you strip it again, or you do whatever, all of a sudden it slims mm -hmm. down. I think one of the most important, there are the most impressive flies that I've seen have the most motion without movement yeah. when they're in that pause phase. Things like marabou, things like uh, hackle, yeah. different things will, while it's in that hovering phase, those flies have motion. Yes. And mm -hmm. so they're in that pause state but they're still kind of attracting fish like, hey, I'm just kind of fluttering here, just waiting for you to eat me. Yeah. And so I, a lot of the musky flies are built like you you have to really take into account because when you're putting those big flies out there and you're having a pause. And so that's that pause and having that little bit of motion in there can be a big difference. I think that's a big deal with uh, that. That's why flies sometimes outperform hardware hmm. and sometimes it's the opposite. But, you know, hardware doesn't, uh, lures, let's say, doesn't, they don't all, always have that. Most of them don't. Um, an inline spinner, for example, does not have anything on the pause. It, it, has, it just dies. It just falls on the pause. But as you're saying, Bill, we have hackle and marabou and who knows what else built in. Things that move in the current, that the current just, just move it and help it to pulsate and breathe or whatever, whatever term we want to give to it. That's a real advantage mm -hmm. of a fly versus hardware mm -hmm. sometimes. Yeah. Austin, do you have yeah. something? I know some pretty diehard gear fishermen who enter these bass tournaments and things like that. Yeah. And one thing they'll one thing they'll tell you is that what separates the the best fishermen of these tournaments versus the ones who are just okay is their ability to control their lure um, with the rod tip instead mm. of just their with their hand reeling in. Yes. Which is um, if you could kind of compare just a constant retrieve of a, of a hand cranking reel to a, um, a modern streamer approach of bang the banks and strip it right back to you. Yeah. Um, those things could kind of um, align with one another. But when we bring in the rod tip, 
and make the fly come alive with the rod tip. I spent a day with Joe Humphreys on the stream one day, and something he drilled into my head was make the fly come alive with the rod tip. Make the fly come mm. alive with the rod tip. And I we like put streamers together the whole day. Oh, that's and cool. uh, that always stuck with me. Yeah, for sure. Mm. Like you say, make it come alive. And there's two ways to do it, you know, with the hand and then with the rod tip. And for me, it's a handoff back and forth, back and forth between the two. I'll say using a jerk strip, a gallop, Kelly Gallop jerk strip is a great way to learn that handoff between those, well, between the two things, the rod tip motion of the jerk. And now you strip in your slack as you return your rod tip to where it needs to be so you can do the next jerk. I often teach that jerk strip, jerk strip. And once you can, it's like patting your head and rubbing your stomach at first. It feels strange. And then all of a sudden you get it. And then you can do a jig strip and then you can just twitch strip. To me, those are all kind of different things, but very, very similar. You're, you're handing it off to your line hand, and now back to your now, now your rod hand does the work. By using both, you can really do things that uh, you can't do any other way. If all you're doing is stripping, well, you're, your animations are limited. Yeah, it's almost you're adding that second dimension of movement. It's like you're like the marionette master, and you get all your fingers in the strings. I love that. You know? <laughs> there you go. That's good. <laughs> Yeah, I wish I had more contact points. Uh, yeah, with the marionette, I like that. I wish I had more contact points, yeah. more rod tip. Uh, rod tips. Right, right. <laughs> third, third point of contact. So you're articulating well, I think it, streamer, yeah. All we're talking about here is sort of assuming fishing streamers on the monorig, and I think that's one of the huge advantages to what the monorig offers is this dynamic interplay between you know, we're, we're always in contact. We always have the ability to have contact and we're typically fishing within a, a proximity that allows for better contact and movement. And, you know, to be able to hold a lot of that line off the water and pause a, pause a streamer, flip the head up, flip it back down. Yeah. It's such a, there's so much more available to you as far as controlling the drift of that streamer and, and animating it than, if you have all your fly line on the water and you're just relying upon men's upstream or downstream and you're really having to do a lot more work to to impart some of the same and you can make those adjustments a lot faster than you can if you have a bunch of line on the water because say you're you're using fly line and you want to and you want to do a head flip or something like that you have to actually mend that line up above the fly or down below the fly and then give Mm -hmm. it a quick strip or something to to get it to react to that that weight whereas if you know if you're fishing something with your line and cider above the water then all it takes is a slight adjustment of your rod tip and you get that fly or a slight lift and adjustment of your rod tip and all of a sudden that fly changes its head it it looks up and then the current Mm. catches it and then it reacts to that it does that pulse thing that we were talking about where the materials kind of compress and then it turns Mm -hmm. back you know and it breathes again Yeah, Trevor, I'm glad you brought that up because, yeah, all of us do a lot of these uh, presentations on a mono rig, but you could do them with almost any any rig. You Mm -hmm. can do it with a sinking line, you can do it with a floating line and a standard leader. But as Josh is saying, really, uh, it it can be more work to do a number of these animations that we are already talking about and that we'll get to. It can be more work. Uh, It it takes more movement and perhaps it's uh, less precise too. Yep. Um, yep. So all streamer presentations really come down to a few key things. There's really the head position, the depth, the speed, and then whether we're holding one seam or crossing seams. And Josh, you were just talking about the head position. Mm-hmm. Um, as soon as the fly goes in, as soon as that streamer hits the water, really when it's in the air, I'm already planning for it. But as soon as it hits the water, now I'm thinking, what's the head position of that streamer? Yep. I do not think, I don't think trout care about the head position of a dry fly or the head position of a, of a nymph. It's too small of a creature for them to care about it. We've talked about this before. On a streamer, I'm sure they care about it. I really am. I'm sure that they recognize that, hey, that's a bait fish. Hey, that's a sculpin. Hey, that's a crayfish. Hey, that's a small trout. I'm going to go eat it. Where's the head? Mm-hmm. I firmly believe... Mm-hmm that they are looking for the head position of that streamer. So it matters to me because it matters to the trout. And I'm always thinking about that direction or the head position, the angle uh, of the streamer. Uh, what's your favorite head position, Josh? I'd say I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to specify to during the daytime. If I, right if I cast <laughs> nice. up and mm-hmm. slightly across from me, then I like for the head position to mostly be 
slightly da- slightly facing down and towards me yeah. as it comes off. I'm Usually, I'm, I'm let's let's say it's coming off the bank as it comes off the bank. Mm-hmm. That's how I want it. But you know, throughout the drift, like we were saying, that can that can change multiple times. Yeah, you can throughout flip. every drift. Yeah, 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 for sure. What do you guys? What do the rest of you think? What's your favorite head position, or do you even think about that? I do. I, I would agree with Josh in that that slightly downstream head position is is my go to. Yeah. But I do. Sw- I flip that between like a sort of an equally opposing upstream, like maybe upstream forty five, and then I'll flip it back to downstream mm. as just sort of a maybe a inducing a take. You know, so early on in my drift, I might flip it from up to down. Mm. Um, and it, it, if you walk across a stream and ever like kick sculpins out yeah. under your feet as yeah. you're walking. It's kind of kind of cool to watch them swim. And yeah. they do that, like, they'll kind of like dart across a seam and then hold, dart across a seam and hold, but their head, it'll switch when they move and then it'll hold again ah, in a particular yeah. direction. Um, but I wonder what you guys think about, like, that downstream head position. Do you think that's mimicking a wounded bait fish or is it just a more natural presentation? Like, why, why do you think we do that? I think the downstream head position looks like they are either escaping or relocating, mm-hmm. getting, you know, uh, what you were yep. saying about the sculpins, like you say, they'll relocate and then like any fish, they have to face into the current. So they reorient yep. their head. And we're already yep. talking about this head flip. The head flip is really my best trigger for, uh, for turning fish on, you know, if I, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> and so that's a presentation to me, this head flip. And so we think about the orientation of the fly head as soon as it goes in. And then, yeah, I might change it throughout the drift. I always go back to thinking about if I was a trout, if I was a bait fish trying to escape. And <laughs> That's a, a good place to start. The same thing, right? <laughs> uh, if I was a trout. You could move a lot faster mm. running down downstream than you could running upstream. And something that has always told me is, you know, why, why, would, a, why would an escaping uh, prey try to to uh, run in an opposite direction that, that would make it slow down. Right. So when I think about my retrieve, I, I often think about, well, I mean, it makes most sense logically that I would retrieve it back downstream towards myself. I'm going to offer the, the uh, trout something that it sees coming towards it. Um, yes. It's probably going to be able to see it for a, a little while off due to its size yeah. most often. Um, to be honest, I don't do I do not do well with the head flip. I, do, I try it a lot, but I've never noticed it like turn the trick for me. You ever flip it, it wrong? That's right. It's, it's Austin's just throwing it wrong. Well, maybe I'm doing it wrong. No, no. Listen, but that, it might I've be tried this. a lot of different ways. So uh, let's say head, head head face down and across for most mm-hmm. of the presentation. Then I'll flip it, and now it's faced up and across. At what point in the presentation, though? When it's when it's right across from you? When it's above you? When it's below you? When do you flip it? Let's say it's right across from me. Okay. Okay. And so now it's faced down and across. Now I flip it and it's faced up and across. But then right away, yeah. I flip it back to down and across. 90% of the time, I do what I call a double head flip. <laughs> so I flip it up and oh, this is too right much. back. <laughs> <That's> not, <laughs> okay. It's really not. So, all right, up and back. It's that double head flip that makes it look like a bait fish that's trying to escape, as you said, trying to get away. Yep. And yeah. And so it's yeah. using the current to help it get away. And then I'll flip the head. And possibly that looks like a, like a bait fish uh, saying, mm-hmm. all right, let me write myself in the current and then just get, get down here. And then it goes, oh, I don't have the energy. And it's now faltering. And then it goes, ah, yeah, it's faltering. Mm-hmm. Thank does you, Trevor. It it? At what point does it most often eat it in that head flip? Right. It, it, for me, it's in that second part of the head flip when it starts it to go. It goes back to downstream. Yep. And it starts to go, okay. oh, let yep. me get out of here again. Let me get out of here. Then That's cool. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I'm glad to know that works for you because that would give me more. It can. Uh, you know, nothing. And, and it works it. every there time. Some, some it works more every tries. Time. Yep. Yeah. Guaranteed, put more fish in the net. 90% of the time, it works sometimes. I like, <laughs> the, I like the head flip and then the pause. Right. Because if, I, because if I'm, I, you know, I'm coming at me, I head flip it, I pause it, and all the head flip is doing is changing the orientation of the fly. Yeah. So instead of the fly facing towards you at that point, this let's say I turn it and it faces upstream. So you give that fish a different profile yes. of the fly. And so I think that's like, I think it's the profile change. Or the pause. The big, yeah. Or the, it, yeah. And so with those two things in tandem, you know, it, it, you know, if a, if a bait fish is dying and it just kind of rolls over. Yeah it's going to roll over and it's going to hang in the current and it's just, you know, hanging out there, you know, that's nice big profile facing right at the fish saying, eat me. Yeah. Cool. Have you ever watched, I, like we used to do it a lot fishing for bass and we, so you could see it in the water, like right there in front of you, you know? 
Yeah. And it would just try to keep itself balanced. It kind of looks like that. You guys ever see how like a bait mm. fish when it's dying will keep trying to stay? Sure. Right. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. 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 It's yeah. like it's yeah. like dying, yeah. dying, dying. Mm-hmm. It tries for a second, dying, dying, dying. Mm. It kind of the yeah. a head flip with a pause kind of looks like that. Oh, right on. Mm-hmm. Good point. Just catch a couple ball fish and smack them in the head and throw them back in. <laughs> See what they look like. <laughs> See what they look like. I like that. Now, do you? Do everybody, you guys everybody any... out there should just just <laughs> smack, smack and fall fish in the head. <laughs> Tell them Bill, right. Bill Dell right. told you to do that. Yep, Bill Dell. Do you guys ever have like? Do you ever get into a, an entirely downstream? As in, do you do? You, do you ever spend time casting upstream, retrieving that streamer down to you, picking back up, casting upstream, rather than kind of an across or and a down and across? Do you have any presentation styles that you particularly like for casting upstream and bringing it back to you? I'd say only when it's treated a little bit more like a nymph, like pocket water, that kind of thing. I might Mm. cast directly Mm. upstream and just dance it through pocket water and stuff like that directly downstream to me. Is that a rod tip animation then? Yeah, it it looks a whole lot like nymphing, just with some Mm. jigs and some control around the rock, stuff like that, around structure, things like that. The dance. So let me ask you this, Josh. You're talking about uh, this nymphing, almost nymphing presentation with the streamer and then doing some little animations. I kind of call that a crossover technique. Mm. But it really leads me to this second kind of key thing. We talked about the head position, but now the depth is important. How deep is my streamer? And when you're talking about this nymphing present, eh, kind of a nymphing presentation mm-hmm. on a streamer, at least to start, how deep are you? Oh, I, think it, I think it varies all through the drift. You know, okay. So, like, if it if I drop it, if it if it's coming down towards a rock between that's the rock that's between me and it, likely what I'm going to do is I'm going to pull it around that lot rock or let the current bring it around the rock, and then oh, I'm going to get it yeah. into that soft water and I'm going to let it sink for a second, and then I'll maybe give it a couple jigs and then back up mm-hmm. a shallow into the faster water. Oh, I like that. So you're but you're always aware of all these things. You know, we're aware of the head position, we're aware of the depth, mm. and so many of the presentations that we do. You know, maybe even in future podcasts, we'll get into more very specific, how do we do all these presentations that some of them we we have names for, but it's head position, it's depth. And now let's talk about speed, a young love. You said, you said not too long ago in a podcast, how you're a low and slow kind of guy. Tell me about that. Yeah. Um, so I prefer, uh, as I said before, my my first tactic I will resort to will be kind of the low and slow. Yeah. Um, what that means is I often fish pretty close to the bottom, but I also don't fish very fast. Yeah. Um, I like to kind of not necessarily crawl them, maybe uh, fish those flies at the same pace as the current. Mm. Um, a lot of our sculpins um, don't have swim bladders in them. Right on. So they aren't very buoyant, and they'll, they literally just – roll around towards the rocks and that's sometimes what I'll try to mimic. Mm. Um, But I won't do it sometimes in a way that looks like they're, they're freaking out and they're going to be really easy to swim away either, you know, do it real slow end up in a trout's area and make the trout feel pretty confident that it's going to be able to get its mouth on. That's pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah. You like that slower presentation. Mm. I like the reason for it. Yeah, me too. Our brown trout here are conservationists by nature. <laughs> right on. <laughs> you have good ways of putting things. I like that. <laughs> I, li- I like it high in the water column. I know just you do. For, yeah. Just just for the fact that I want to see them eat it. It's fun. It's fun to fish flies that you can see, streamers. See, that's that what I don't see. want. That's the last oh, thing I, I want. know. That's why uh, I like both of you guys. <laughs> <laughs> but so um, as far as like the speed of the retrieve, I'll vary it. Sure. But. I don't like a really fast retrieve. Sure. Just or mm. if I move the fly fast, whether it be the rod tip or stripping it, it's only for a few feet, and then I want a long pause because if you constantly move that fly fast, you end up with you end up getting it back to you too quickly, and mm. it, sometimes that fish follows to your feet, and you're mm-hmm. like, ah, crap. He never had a Where, chance. Maybe he never had a chance. So. Like if you, let's say there's a piece of structure, I throw it out and I'll strip fast around that structure. Yeah. But once I'm about a foot off, foot or two feet off the structure, give it a long pause and just see if something comes out of there. Because that, that, lo- that really long pause, I call a super pause, <laughs> <laughs> man, it just, it, sometimes it's, it's deadly. It's, it's really deadly for bass, but there are times the trout, you know, literally like a five or six second pause. Wow. And that's the fish, a lot. And the fish just show up like you're like, where did that thing come from? But 
it works sometimes. Is it dropping during that pause? I prefer it not to. I'd uh, rather I want a streamer that's kind of neutrally, kind of neutrally buoyant. Yeah. And so I don't want it to sink during that time. I want it to just kind of hover. All right. And and your rig, our, your rig allows you to control that. Yeah. You find you can control the amount of slack that goes into that pause. One thing I've learned is. I, sometimes I would get lazy and not, I'd strip and then I'd kind of let my hand further behind me as if like I finished the strip and, you know, like a guy hitting a home run, standing there admiring it. And so, you know, you, you take that long strip and you, your hand's just sitting there admiring it. Then the fish eats it and you're like, crap, I got nothing to set the hook with. And so like. But you're feeling it most of yeah. the times that uh, during that pause, when they hit it, you're aware. You're ready to, to strike. I'm ready. Yeah. That, so like that, it's, it's not strip, much slack. long pause and then you're waiting. To me, okay. I don't have any slack at that point when it's paused. I'm pointing the rod tip well, at the fish and I'm, you know, okay. hand is loaded, ready to strip. Right, because if, if I'm you, doing it right. Ready if, to strip. If you, had, if you had slack, it would be dropping. And I asked if, you, if it was right. dropping and you said you're pretty much holding it right there. That's the thing. You want to have control over your streamer pretty much all the way through, you know, and we have mm -hmm. control over the head position. We have control over the depth. And now we're talking about having control over the speed. And now the pause is, well, part of the speed. That's great. I love that. Um, so Bill doesn't like fast stuff. You guys ever do, do well with fast retrieves? I get a lot of chases on fast retrieves. That's fair. I think it, yeah, I see, I see fit, it move fish. But I, in terms of hooked up fish and fish in the net, I don't think I've ever done better with a purely fast retrieve. But I also don't go to it very often. I'm going to agree with that. But what do you mean by how fast is fast? Oh, I don't know. Let's say each strip uh, goes two feet. That's oh, pretty wow. fast. Yeah, that is, yeah, I'd say that's pretty fast. Yeah. I do that most from a boat. Yeah. Uh, we talked about floating versus waiting. And yeah, when you're covering 10, 12, 14 miles sometimes in, in a boat, you can do some different things. And you're really looking, you're looking for the hungry fish. And then sometimes I got to settle myself down. If I'm not catching fish, I go, hmm, okay, relax. Mm -hmm. And like Bill says, let them eat it, you know? Yeah. Don't take it feed away it from them. Feed it to them. Don't take it away from them. Mm -hmm. Bill's really a fantastic uh, streamer fisherman, and I've learned a lot from you, bud. You're welcome. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> that was good. One more thing, really, about these streamer presentations and, and the animations that it really comes down to. Are we holding one seam or are we crossing seams? Now, when we're nymphing, for example, if we're nymphing, we are really trying hard to hold one seam because that's the only way you get a true dead drift is by holding mm -hmm. one seam. And I'll often do that with my streamers. I do what I call a speed lead. Uh, that's one of my favorite things to do. A lot of my crossover technique kind of stuff kind of holds one seam. And then eh, if it crosses over a little bit, that's all right. Because it, again, it's a bait fish with a propulsion system that can cross, cross seams and swim kind of wherever it wants to within reason. And so I'm always thinking about head position, depth, speed. And then I'm thinking, am I crossing seams with my streamer? Or am I just kind of holding that one seam? What do you guys like? I like to change it up. I think Josh mentioned, mentioned sure. before how he likes to dead drift on occasion through pocket water or with particular streamers. I love taking a woolly bugger um, with a bead head and just kind of dead drifting it down through the current. But I think to me, my, my presentation is kind of guided towards how much energy or how wounded this particular bait fish that Ooh, I'm trying to mimic like is, that. you know? Yeah. So if it's, uh, the, I think you've mentioned and written about a style of retrieve called a death drift. And that death drift I like a lot um, and, and it's really trying to mimic a, a wounded bait fish or a bait fish that's really on its last leg. <laughs> yeah. Well, that thing, it's about that, Right. Yeah. That thing just doesn't have enough energy to get across seam. So he's kind of following one seam, maybe making his way up and then just kind of falling a little bit, making his yeah. way up, making falling a little. And that contrasted with a bait fish that's maybe a little more alive or quite alive where I'm crossing seams primarily. I like to, uh, sometimes cast 30 to 40 feet upstream. Okay. And do both of these things in one retrieve. So I'll cast upstream quite far away mm. and I'll cross seams coming back. Sure. Um, to the point where I still have a pretty good control over the fly. And then when it gets near me, I'll lift up all that slack, no line on the water, and I'll sort of tight line or dead drift that fly 
through the water that's in mm. front of me. And depending on the data I gather, on the eats I get <laughs> during that drift, yeah. that'll lend itself to the answer for the rest of the day, just like we talked about with nymphing. I'll figure mm. out kind of in a wide approach with my cast and with my retrieve, which method of retrieve they prefer. Uh, yeah. And then I'll move like to that, that method primarily. Dude, that's, yeah, that's like really, that. I love that. Honestly, I do the opposite. And like I learned, <laughs> I, I learned something just now and I learned something from you guys all the time. What I do, Austin, the most is the opposite. I often will establish a dead drift and then I'll start moving it. But you're mm. saying you do the reverse. Yeah. I like that. I do something similar. So first, let me say that a lot of times to start the day, I do as little movement as possible to see if the fish will eat it that way. Because if I'm doing less movement, then that's less line to catch up with. That's, you know, I'm better in contact. But um, kind of to what Austin's saying is I will th- I like to throw up at a 45 degree angle. Sure. And I'll, I'll kind of strip and generate some movement with it. And then when it comes like parallel to me, I'll I'll lower the rod tip and I'll point it at I'll point it at the fly and I'll let it in that same seam and I call it the glide. Mm. And so from the point when it's pointed directly at me until it reaches like, you know, once it's at a forty five below me, I think then at that point I consider it a swing. Then it's gonna but, s- swing, yeah, yeah, yeah. But but like that, the angle directly across from me to that forty five. I'm just letting it glide through that seam. And man, there's some days that that's just the best trigger you can do, it seems like. When it's gliding, Bill, as you just described, where what's the head position? Pointed right at me. And which would be up and across, down and across? It starts pointed right across from me. So and then once it's it's pointed yeah. at me at all times and I'm I'm positioning like I guess the rod tip is follow like so the streamer is across from me. Yeah. Um, the head position is pointed to me, and as that streamer gets below me, I'm just pointing the rod tip at it the entire way downstream so that it's, by pointing it at there, it's kind of, it's holding in the kind of same seam, mm-hmm. and it's also holding at the same depth, so ah, it's yeah. just kind of sitting there for an easy meal. What you're describing is what I call a slow slide. I love that, too. That's a great... Great look. And it's holding its seam for as long as possible. And that's kind of where, what we're addressing is whether we want uh, the streamer to hold its seam or to cross seams. Guys, we've touched a little bit on natural versus attractive looks. Um, we're talking about what a bait fish does naturally on the bottom of the stream. What does that sculpin do at the bottom? What does that black nosed dace do at the bottom? What does the crayfish do? What does the small trout do or the, uh, the fall fish? <laughs> um, are, are we trying to represent natural things or attractive things? And, oh, I think all the other things, the head position, the depth, the speed, and whether we're holding one current seam or crossing, all that factors in. What do you guys like to do? Around here, what's your best presentation? Is it natural or is it attractive, trying to attract the trout? Or are you trying to show them something that they're used to seeing? For me... I am trying to make it as natural as possible with a slight hint of attractive uh, attractiveness. <laughs> You're trying so to have I it both this, ways. Yeah. Well, no, I'm not. 98% of my preferred drift, it will look like a naturally uh, yeah. drifting or maybe it's just sitting on the bottom looking upstream doing nothing but holding its position. Okay. With a, just a, a tinge of a, a twitch. Sure. But for most of that presentation, it's 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 sitting pretty. I'm, I'm, pic- I'm picturing one of your drifts just being like five minutes. It's like three minutes of sitting in its spot. <laughs> I, know. I know. Low and slow, baby. Uh, but yeah. at the same time, you don't want them to see it for five yeah. minutes. So there's a little bit of balance yeah. there. Yeah. I would say that it's probably pretty similar to what Austin said. And I'd, I'd specified the word I'd use to describe it is I just want it to look vulnerable. And that can be, oh, and that can be yeah. natural okay. or that can be attractive the attractive motions that i usually give it because we were just talking about speed i don't fish all that yeah. fast and, and i don't have a whole lot of confidence in fast retrieves like big yeah. two foot strips and stuff but i do want it to look vulnerable and sometimes you have to get it a little bit out of that natural look for it to look vulnerable nice like a slow like Ooh, i do yeah, like that yeah yeah naturally yeah. vulnerable oh there you go <laughs> there you go i don't know i lean on i i like the kind of the attractive stuff like you know, yeah. animating the fly, but there has to be kind of a balance between 
not overdoing it because sometimes you can overdo it so much that you're you're never giving yourself a good time to set the hook if you're trying to animate it with strips and jerks and twitches mm. if you're doing all that that comes with a cost of losing contact oh. and losing the ability to be in a good position to set the hook oh that's nice how many, how do you like it though the way i kind of understood streamer fishing from the beginning was oh hey you know cast it quartering downstream and now just let it swing out, swing out, swing out until it's downstream of you. And now cast it again, 45 degrees across and down and uh, let it swing out. Almost like a traditional wet fly swing, which I don't do that much either. Uh, I don't do that with a streamer. Um, that to me is a very unnatural look. You mentioned this earlier, Austin, that most bait fish, really every bait fish, doesn't have really the strength to just hold in the current, in the middle of the current, head mm -hmm. position faced upstream, fight that current, and just hold there. Why would it do that? It doesn't, <laughs> you know. It's really, <laughs> it's trying to be at the bottom and 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 have some protection. Um, bay fish don't do that. And yet, and yet, many trout, different areas of the country, many trout will take that presentation where you're swinging. That's, that's a deadly presentation to stocked fish. Right on, yes. For me, mm. like, because they're, to them, it looks like an easy meal where, mm. like, a wild fish probably looks at that and says, eh, it's not really something that I want to eat because I know better. It's what I call attractive. It's not natural. It's yes. not something that the any fish is used to seeing, and yet the stocked fish will often go, man, I'm eating that. And the wild yep. trout kind of go, what the heck's that? And they <laughs> will often swipe at it or come up and look at it, and you might get fooled, like you said in the last podcast, Bill. You, you called it fool's gold. <laughs> and I like yeah. that, fool's gold. Um, they'll look at it, and yet they won't eat it. And you kind of get fooled into thinking like, man, I got something going. I got something going. And yet probably your better presentation is to go with something that is not attractive uh, as much as natural. You're also asking that trout to come pretty close to the surface. I know for me, when I, when I try to do that approach – I struggle to keep the fly deeper in the column, which is oh, yeah. ultimately what I would prefer. But you're asking a, a a trout to come charging off the bottom of the the river up towards the surface and 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 put themselves in a pretty precarious situation. And uh, our wild trout just don't like to do that. I agree with that. That's a good point to make. That goes back to what you you and you and Bill were not arguing about, but disagreeing on is is how close to the surface <laughs> you wrong. like the. I just want to point out that Bill's always wrong. <laughs> yeah, I'm always wrong. <laughs> yeah, just just in regards to how close your streamer is to the surface and is that why yeah. you do it austin is that why you like it deeper just because it's it's uh it doesn't require as much vulnerability from the trout yeah i think it's just asking less and anytime i can ask less i'm gonna do that until they until they tell yeah. me otherwise <laughs> right make it more available to the trout and bill you yeah. say this all the time again like don't don't take it away from them so much let them eat it and so I'm often trying with my presentations to uh, mimic something that is available, is vulnerable, as Trevor said earlier, uh, damaged or or crippled. You know, something that the trout go, ooh, I'm eating that. There you go. That's sort of their job, right, is to clean up, <laughs> clean up <laughs> what's damaged and broken in the river system. If you can give them that look, sometimes it's uh, irresistible. Nice. So guys, let's talk a little bit about presentation styles. We talk about the head position and which which angle that head is faced at. We talked about depth and speed and whether we're holding one seam or crossing seams, whether it's natural or attractive, whether we're making it easy for the trout to eat it or we're kind of making them chase it. What are your favorite presentation styles? Do you, do you have names for them like I, like I do or do you just kind of wing it? I, I just call it catching fish. Yeah, there you go, right? <laughs> I guess one, one, I don't know if you want to call it presentation, yeah. I guess, but um, one thing I try to focus on is try to have a plan and don't turn into a robot Ooh, when I'm out there. Yeah. Cast, strip, cast, strip, nice. cast, strip. Like when I, I, I try to, when I streamer fish, I try to make less cast, but I try to make them more accurate and more meaningful. <laughs> Meaning if there's a, if there's a log and then there's a big rock, I, I'm going to position myself to per, to make one good, my first presentation be my best. And so when the fly lands, in my mind, I have a plan. Like there's a log. I'm going to strip. 
I'm going to kind of do a head flip. I'm going to let it pause in front of the log because maybe there's something underneath the log. And then, you know, maybe a couple strips more. And then I'm going to pause in front of the big rock. Like where there's a spot where I feel like there could be a, a fish, like a high probability of a fish being. Yeah. I, I want to create pauses in the cast or the retrieve so that that fish has the opportunity to eat it. Bill, I'm glad you brought that up. One thing that I, w- I want to hit on again is uh, you mentioned that that first presentation being your best. And I tend to agree with that. One of the uh, last year is when I kind of came into to agreement. We had really low water last year, uh, all through the fall, especially. And I had a stretch of days there um, in one week of October where I had fantastic streamer fishing in, in very low and clear water. I was nice. getting very high numbers of streamer eats. And because it was so low and clear, I could also nearly watch every eat. And something I learned is that each time I cast that streamer in a likely place, one, in my wild trout rivers, there's probably a fish there. Yeah. And two, if I place my fly there, that fish is going to see it. It's not going to slowly drift by it and it not notice. Mm. Um, I kind of became convinced of that um, because of that uh, visual uh, advantage I had. And each likely place I cast that fly, I see a a trout that I didn't know was there, move out of a rock, move out of a bank, move out of a log, look at it, commit to it, or move back in. And if I were to fish up through that area sloppily, the results of hookups and looks uh, went down quite dramatically. Nice. Yeah. Fishing with intention. Right. Mm. Yeah. Sure. I think I think Gallup says hunt it, don't hope it, or some somewhere along the lines of that. Right on, for sure. Do you do you know what you're doing when the fish eats? Do you go? Oh, yeah. That was on a uh, a tight line dance, or that was on a slow slide. I don't have names for it, but I guess I I always when it, when a fish eats, or when a fish looks at it, or when a fish rejects it, it's a mental note like do that again, or when I do that again, be ready because. Sometimes you'll go 15, 20, 30 minutes without an eat, but when you get that next eat, remember the water type it was in, remember the structure around it, remember what you did to trigger that, and then try to replicate it again. So you do believe it's a trigger, and you'll try to do it again? Yeah. Yeah. Most most times. And so all these presentation styles, they, they really are a combination of, again, the head position, the depth of the fly the speed of the fly, and whether I'm holding seams or crossing seams. All right, thank you, my friends, for another great discussion. So the key to streamer fishing is using the rod and our line hand to give motion to the fly, to bring it to life, to make it look helpless or available to the trout, maybe to make it look like it's escaping prey, or to bring out that predatory nature of the best trout in the river. We spend so much of our time dead drifting other flies, dry flies, nymphs, That switching to streamers is not only a fun change of pace, but it shows the trout something completely different. All of a sudden, we're offering a food that's many times larger. There's really more for a trout to reject in something the size of a streamer. So it's important to get the presentation right so that most trout simply won't ignore what we have to offer. As we've talked about here, all streamer presentations kind of can be boiled down to a few things. How are we moving the fly with the rod and the line hand? What's the cadence or the rhythm? What's the head position of the streamer? What's the depth? What's the speed? And is the streamer crossing seams or mostly holding one seam? With that information and with those intentions, we can make a plan for how to present a streamer and follow through day to day and moment to moment on the water. Hey, so we didn't break down every specific presentation that we mentioned tonight, but you can find each one of these looks to the streamer on troutbitten.com. The speed lead, the head flip, the jerk strip, the jig strip, the touch and go, the tight line dance, the slow slide, the cross current strip, the death drift, and the endless retrieve. Each of those presentations has an article dedicated to it over at Troutbitten. So in the menu, go to Articles, Tactics, Streamer Fishing. You'll find those pieces and so much more among the streamer content of Troutbitten. Hey, thanks again for supporting this podcast. Josh, will you read us out? Yeah, man. All right, guys, remember, troutbitten.com is a free resource for all anglers. So dig in and check it out. Navigate through the menus and find what you like. Share it, leave a comment, 
Use the search page if you're looking for something specific. Navigate by way of the categories and tags, too. Thank you for listening. Please give the show a five-star rating on Apple Podcasts and leave a comment because that really helps. Until next time, friends, fish hard, enjoy the day, and find your life on the water.